God resurrect these bones from death to life for you alone. Awake my soul. Good morning. Man, it is good to be in the house with you. And we're not going to even let that get us this morning, right? <laughs> It is just a joy to be in the house. It is great to see your face this morning. Really good to see that much of your face. Great to be in the house in all the ways that you're able to be here. If you are part of the online family and you've never taken the opportunity to let us know that you watch, it would make a great, uh, it would be a great gift to us if you would uh, text Mosaic Church to 31996. Those of you in the house, a great way for you to handle that is, I mean, to use that texting feature is to let us know how we can pray for you. Praise God together with you for what he's doing in your lives. We take those prayer requests very seriously. Um, you can also let us know if your information has updated. You can let us know also if, um, if, if you need to connect with the group. I'll tell you some more about groups at the end of the service, but we've got groups that are starting this week, and we'd love to have a chance to connect you with an online or in-person group. So text Mosaic Church to 31996 and it will let you do all those things. It's magical. I've been thinking a lot. I've been reading uh, a book called Analog Church, which is just a, a word about making sure we don't lose the, uh, the incarnational place of worship, the in-person place of worship. He talks about the difference between watching and witnessing. There's a difference. A lot of you probably, I don't know, maybe not everybody in the room, some of you are diehard dog fans and you were sitting on your sofa watching every last bit of last night's game. Is that anybody in the room? Yeah, I knew, I knew, I knew. I was trying not to point you out, but the pies were doing that last night and I knew that before I even said it. We're the kind of people who kind of walk in and out of the room and check the score. So please don't, don't hate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, we just, we, we, I kind of do other things during the evening, but I love when the game is on because you get to kind of have that great thing going on in the back, assuming they're winning, which they did, go dogs. Um, but, you, you know, you kind of have this, you know, there's, there's a difference then, right, between watching a game, kind of going in and out, checking on it, making sure you're, you can say you are there, and witnessing. And that's the person who is up out of their seat every time you got a touchdown. Is that you guys yelling? Yeah. <laughs> That's mostly shock. Oh no, you're high five, and I thought it was like, no, it's just shock. <laughs> There's a difference between watching and witnessing. And we know because we're all sports fans for something that you can watch or witness on screen just as well as you can watch or witness in person, right? So my call, my, my invitation to you today is to witness. Don't just watch. Receive. Don't just uh, be in the room. Be here. Just uh, don't, don't just let it flow over you while you come and go. But witness. Witness. To be a witness is to participate. It's to be part of the drama of God unfolding in our lives. It's very much the story of Jonah. He gives us how God worked in his life, and that's where we'll be today. I am praying for you, that you will have that witness experience of worship, of the message, of community, wherever you are. Let's worship God.
never stop working. We never stop, we never stop working. Even though I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. We never stop, we never stop working. We never stop, we never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Your phone, still you love. Fall. 
won't light up, the mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, the lie you won't tear down, you're coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, the mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. prayer in Jonah when he finally gets what he doesn't get. He says, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. Deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. He, he says, you hurled me into the depths, <laughs> into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever, but you Lord my God, you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. That is powerful. That is God's work in our lives to bring us up from this fallen place. So this morning I want to give you a time to intercede in some very practical places and then to intercede for yourself. If you'd like to come and find a place here and kneel at the front, you are welcome to come and pray here at the front. If you'd like to make your chair into an altar, you can do that. Whatever makes you feel comfortable. Let's just enter into a time of, of prayer together. I want to pray first for one of, the, one of the places Noah had to learn how to pray was toward the cities 
the city to which he'd been sent and the city to which he ran. Learning to have God's heart for the city, it's a big deal. You don't just live here. It's, it's not a watch, it's a witness. We're part of this. So can I ask you just to take a moment to pray for the city in which you live, the, the, the neighborhood in which you live. Pray that God would bless it. God, we want to be more than just a church that happens to meet in Evans, Georgia, Columbia County, the CSRA. We, we want to hear Jeremiah's prophetic word. Build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters and find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so they may too have sons and daughters. Increase in number, do not decrease and seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you also will prosper. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. God, we want to be people who seek the increase of our own city, whose hearts are broken for what breaks your heart here in this city where we live, where we work, where we worship. We want to be more than just watchers. We want to be witnesses. And God, we also want to pray for the, for the people in our lives right now. We want to intercede for those, for, 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 for followers of Jesus and those who don't follow Jesus, that they would hear your voice, hear the word of the Lord, Jesus. My prayer for us right now is that, is, our, is that, Lord, you would heal that tape that runs in our head that keeps us uh, too firmly placed in, in the arena of judgment rather than intercession. God, allow us the grace to, to truly seek your heart for the people you've placed in our lives. And, and God, toward that end, we need to pray for ourselves personally. That, that we would become intercessors and not just observers. That, that God, teach us to love our enemies. Teach us to love those who irritate us. Help us to see, God, that you've, you've given us people specifically for the purpose of making us aware of us. Give us the grace to see what you see. Would you just pray in this moment, just pray for those who you might call enemies, who God calls children. And Jonah says, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. And I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. No shadow you won't lie, yeah. mountain you won't climb up. 
coming after me. Yeah. Praise Jesus. Those lies you kicked down, lie you won't hear now, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Sing this is worship. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Just to be able to rest in your love, God. Inspire us toward it, Jesus. Everything that you have for us, make us worthy. We love you, honor, and worship you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you, Julian. Man, that's just... Sometimes I'm overwhelmed by how provenient the grace is and even the song choices. Um, I want to... Just jump right in because it's too good not to. Today we're in the book of Jonah. If you need help finding it, it is between Obadiah and Micah. That ought to clear things up, right? <laughs> While you're looking for it, I want to just remind you or tell you a, a, a story, a piece of history uh, during the struggle for civil rights in the 60s. George Wallace, who was the governor of Alabama, ended up in the White House with his state attorney general, and the president of the United States, Lyndon B. Johnson, at the time. They were worried about a march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, which would be to demonstrate against racial injustice. And Wallace was bound and determined to keep that march from happening. He never did get on board with the march, though history tells us that later in his life, he actually did uh, change his views on racial uh, equality. But the conversation in that, in that room at the White House, that's, that's powerful. The, the voice of wisdom in that conversation that day between Wallace and the President of the United States belonged to Johnson, who asked a kind of brilliant question. George, he said, you've got to think about it this way. Would you prefer to be remembered as someone who tore things down or built things up? George what do you want to be remembered as? Do you want to be remembered as a builder or as a hater? That's a great question, isn't it? <laughs> How do you want to be remembered? What do you hope they'll say at your funeral? I know what I want them to say. I want them to say, she's moving. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Actually, I have told my fa family, do not resuscitate. I want to see the face of Jesus when he calls me. But how do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered as a builder or as a hater? Jonah's story helps us wrestle with what we want to be for the world, in the world. The book of Jonah is a powerful prophetic word. It's not a children's story at all, although that tends to be how it is billed. It is not about the fish. <laughs> I want you to look at the first two verses of Jonah's story, just the first two verses. These prophetic books in the Old Testament tend to, tend to um, 
begin with some version of the same introduction. The word of the Lord came to Joseph, uh, Hosea, came to Joel, came to Zechariah, and, and the book of Jonah begins the same way. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Jonah is actually, in Hebrew, it literally means dove. Son of Amittai is son of righteousness, or son of faithfulness, which is off, right off the bat, we get it that this is a book of satire because Jonah was anything but dove-like or faithful-like. Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And then, right there, uh, you know, in a, in, a prof, in a prophetic book, that's usually followed by um, more words of the Lord. But two verses in, the word of the Lord is abruptly interrupted. Hearing this word from God and this charge, Jonah runs for all he's worth in the opposite direction. And the rest of the book is the story of Jonah fighting against God and a word that God wants him to deliver to, oh, and, and, and a world God wants him to to be broken for. Jonah wants nothing of it. Jonah hops a boat for Tarshish, which is geographically as far as you can get from Nineveh, the place he's been sent. Jonah is not just emotionally declaring, but geographically declaring his opposition to God's plan to save Nineveh. And when a storm kicks up and the ship he is on is sent reeling, Jonah is so dedicated to his position that he is oblivious to the collateral damage being caused by his choices. He's the reason the storm is threatening the whole crew on this ship, but he's asleep in the belly of the ship, unaware, uncaring. While the pagans who are sailing the ship, are running frantically around, praying frantically to every god whose name they know. They eventually go down to the belly of the ship, wake him up, and ask, who is responsible for making this trouble for us? What is it you do exactly? And Jonah tells them he's running from the Lord. And if they want the storm to stop, they should just throw him overboard. And that is not an, a, a, a comment of, a tr of contrition. This is Jonah saying, I would rather die than admit I'm wrong. I'd rather die than give in to God's longing heart for people I am completely committed to despising. The sailors he's confessing this to, they're not followers of the one true God. They, they worship pagan gods, but even they were more compassionate than Jonah. They tried everything to keep from tossing him overboard. But when nothing else worked, chapter 1, verse 14, they cried out to the Lord, God, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, which, of course, Jonah is not. <laughs> For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. And then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. These guys got saved. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Isn't that great? Even Jonah's disobedience bears fruit. <laughs> God has decided, he has determined that this man will deliver a message of mercy and compassion and it's leaking from every pore even when he's running from it, even when Jonah doesn't mean for that to happen, doesn't care, isn't trying to be nice to anyone. Isn't it awesome, awesome to find a prophet like this in the Bible? <laughs> Makes you feel better about yourself, doesn't it? who's like us, who's fighting against his call and nurture, nursing his prejudices with every breath while God hangs on to him like a kid hangs on to a kite. There's a lot of humor in this story. It, as a literary style, this, this is satire. It is written satirically. Spoiler alert, so we will be drawn in. The, the author who is Jonah? Who is a real prophet? He knows us. 
He's brilliant. He knows we will delight in his foolishness and faithlessness, so he baits us so we will walk right into the trap set by the prophet himself where we will discover that this story is not about Jonah, it's about us. Isn't that the best? Chapter 1, verse 17, into chapter 2, verse 1. Remember, I want you to remember, Jonah has just been tossed now into the sea. Now, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. It, it never calls this fish a whale, but the fish is not the point, okay? Don't get stuck on that. Jonah provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed. I bet he did. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to notice his descent. If you look back in verse 3, he goes down to Joppa to catch a boat. Then he goes down into the ship's belly. And then he goes down into the sea. And then he goes down into the belly of a fish. Rebellion just keeps pushing him further and further and further down. But it's not about the fish. Have you seen, I may have mentioned this recently, but it's just too funny not to mention again. That, have you seen that little skit on YouTube? I've, it's been years ago since I've shown it in here. It's called, It's Not About the Nail. Have you seen it? That's the best little skit. You need to watch it this afternoon. It is the funniest conversation between a husband and a wife. The wife is complaining about this chronic headache, it's this pain she can't figure out, and, and, and the general sense she has, things are just off. And the whole time she's talking to this, her husband, there is a nail sticking out of her head that she doesn't seem to want to acknowledge is there. She's pointing in the direction of it even. She says, even my sweaters are all snagged, every one of them. And the guy says, you know, maybe if we pulled the nail out of your head and she just immediately goes, don't. You always do that. It's not about the nail. <laughs> To which, you know, he's like, okay, okay. It is so like us, isn't it? It's what we do when we find someone who offends us or hurts us or makes us angry. We want to make it about them while we ignore the brokenness in us that creates space for the spirit of offense to wreak havoc. And so in our need to be right or be heard or be us, we miss the redemptive side of conflict and, and our own chance for transformation. We would rather swim in that river, throw us overboard into the river called denial. <laughs> and Jesus, who knows human nature better than anyone, told us, we would act this way. Luke 6, 42, he said, Why are you so concerned about the speck in someone else's eye when you have a board sticking out of your own? And we're saying, it's not about the board. The story of Jonah has this subtle undercurrent to it. But we do exactly what Jonah did, too many of us. We want to stop everything and argue the details so we can discount the real central part of the message which hits so close to home. We want to say, seriously, can, I mean, can a fish swallow a person? Can a person live who swallows a fish? Come on, that can't be true. Is it a fish or a whale? Which is it? I mean, really, is any of this really true? But friends, we are a religion built on miracles. <laughs> you probably don't need to really start with questioning whether Jonah and the fish is true because we have a God who came all the way down to earth as a man. This is what we believe. Jesus was swallowed up by death and stayed in the belly of that darkness 
for three days before he was brought back to life. Our redemption depends on that story being true. And, and Jesus would link our faith to that extreme miracle in this story of Jonah when he told the religious leaders, you're looking for a sign, but the only sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah, which is to say, that if Jonah's story is true, which is not something an ancient scholar would have questioned, then so is the miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ, through whom we are all transformed. And Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, we who are living will also be transformed. And when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Hallelujah. So Jonah is swallowed up, not so he will die, but so he has some chance to live. From the belly of that fish, he cried out to God and poured out his heart and repented, and God heard him. And Jonah 2, verse 10, the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. <laughs> That's kind of graphic. You know, the Hebrew word for vomit is ka. That's the best, isn't it? And then in chapter 3, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. All right, I'm just going to wait for you now, he says. I want you to go to the city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And this time, Jonah obeyed. I bet he did. Which is not to say he was any more in love with that big city. And you can get it. You can get it. Here's the thing about Nineveh. It was a mean city. These were mean people. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. On a contemporary map today, it would be at the top end of Iraq. In the 8th and 7th centuries BCE, the Assyrians were the bullies of the Middle East. They especially liked picking on Palestine. They burned and looted and laid waste to farmland. They eventually stole the top half of Israel. So that's who God was asking Jonah, an Israelite, to go talk to. You can understand how it might be hard for him. It'd be something, it would be something like asking a UGA fan to love a Florida fan. I hear you people. Or more seriously, asking a Jewish person to minister into the life of a Nazi. Or more personally, asking you to speak life into someone who has hurt you. You can fill in your own blank there. And God is saying to Jonah and to us, come on, how do you want to be remembered? How do you want to be remembered as a builder or as a hater? God gave Jonah a great call. <laughs> It was the opportunity to point the people of a lost city to a great God, but Jonah missed it by a mile. His message to them was five Hebrew words long, eight words in English, 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed, <laughs> overthrown. Not exactly a gripping appeal. It would be basically like you driving by someone stranded with a flat tire on a dark highway, calling out your window as you zoom by, hey, your tire's flat and you're probably going to get mugged before it gets fixed. It's about the flavor of Jonah's prophetic word as he walked across that city. It took three days. It was so big. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. But I want you to remember, Jonah is leaking the word of the Lord. And, and even the drops of it are powerful. So even that anemic proclamation gets results. Jonah, uh, uh, Nineveh is immediately repentant. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 5 says, The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them from the 
greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Even the king put on sackcloth. Even the animals put on sackcloth. Tim Mackey of the Bible Project reminds us that this is part of the satire, the animals wearing sackcloth like animals can repent, but it's a reminder, too, of our interconnectedness and of how our bad choices ripple out into the world. Think uh, uh, Jonah in the bottom of that boat, you know. our, Our bad choices ripple out and affect other things. I wonder what it was in Jonah that kept him from feeling simple compassion for a group of people. You know, they say the only way we can hold on to our grudges is by reducing the people we're mad at to, a, to, to one-dimensional human beings. They, we, we have to reduce them to their, that one thing they've done to us. They become the sum total of that one thing. And, 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 and we forget that they are a complex human being and broken just like us. That's Jonah's downfall. He was unable to see all God sees. He had reduced the Ninevites to this one simple thing. They are my enemy, and that's it. That's it, and I will die before I change my mind about that. And Jesus said, The only sign I give you is the sign of Jonah. Which is not only a sign of death being swallowed up in life, it is also a call to get swallowed up by the heart of God. So Tim Mackey, the guy who does the Bible Project, you should look it up if you haven't. In his message on Jonah, he quotes Walter Wink in Engaging the Powers. It's an old classic, classic book. Wink writes, this is the gift. I want you to hear this. This is powerful. It's a little bit of a long quote, but I want you to hear it. Wink says, this is the gift our enemy may be able to bring to us, to see aspects of ourselves that we cannot discover any other way than through our enemies. Our friends seldom show us our flaws. They are our friends precisely because they are able to overlook or ignore those parts of us. The enemy is therefore not merely a hurdle to be leaped over on the way to God. Our enemy might actually be the way to God. We cannot come to terms with our own inner shadows except through our enemies. We have almost no other access to those unacceptable parts of ourselves that need redeeming except through the mirror that our enemies hold up to us. Surely this is why Jesus spends so much time on these chafing relationships in the Sermon on the Mount. Read chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 5 all the way through in one sitting and you will be stunned at just how committed Jesus was to, and is to peacemaking. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. You have heard it was said, and I'm just jumping around here in this chapter. You've heard it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable, that's fool or idiot, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be danger in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, you leave your gift there and go be reconciled to them first. Then come and offer your gift. Sell matters quickly, it says, and your adv- with your adversary. And he says, you've heard it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to the other cheek also. He goes on, give to the one who asks you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you, even if that borrowing is an emotional borrow. 
He says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven, which kicks us right back to verse 9. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they will be called children of God. And sprinkled all through that teaching in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is asking us to be light, to be righteous, to have wisdom, wisdom in our dealings to seek unity. Peace is not an afterthought, but a core message of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be children of God. And at the end of his life, Jesus tells his followers, my peace I give you, and I do not give as the world gives. The only sign I give you is the sign of Jonah who wraps all this up into a prophetic story that challenges us to see what God sees in people. Could it be? I'm sure this is not my question originally, but I don't know who said it first, but it's worth writing down. Could it be that the person in your life who is causing you grief is there precisely because God is inviting you into a deeper experience of his grace for you. Could it be that the person in your life who is causing you grief is there precisely because God is inviting you into a deeper experience of his grace for you. Do you know the term schadenfreude? It's a German word for that experience I'm quoting of pleasure, joy, or self-satisfaction that comes from learning of or witnessing the troubles, failures, or humiliation of another not really an English equivalent to this word, but it, lots of languages have a word for this because it is a product of human nature. We all do it. We get it, right? We don't want to admit it, but sometimes we feel good when other people feel bad. You know that old question, why, is, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, I think the, probably, the, probably the better question is, why do we feel good when other people feel bad? <laughs> Our world is thick right now with schadenfreude. That the sick pleasure we get when we find that someone we don't like or someone we disagree with is wrong or worse, that they are suffering. Jonah's whole story could be reduced to this one word, schadenfreude. His problem with God's call was that Nineveh might get saved might not be destroyed, which was what he was, he got in a second box of popcorn so he could watch that happen. It was a problem for Jonah that, that, Jenema, that, that, that Nineveh might get saved because Jonah knew his God, and he was right. Nineveh repented and was saved from destruction. They responded, and so now, if he hadn't already, the real Jonah shows up. He goes from being passive-aggressive to just flat-out aggressive. Jonah is mad. He tells God, chapter 4, verse 2, I knew you were gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And he says all this as an accusation, not as an act of worship. <laughs> and then he goes and he sits down outside the city to sulk. While he's sitting there, a vine grows up and gives him some shade. And for the first time in the whole story, Jonah is happy. It's a strange happiness that reveals how self-centered he really is. All I really wanted was just to be comfortable, God. So God causes the vine to wither and die. And Jonah's mood dies with it. 
It's like this plant becomes a symbol of all that's wrong in his life. He laments the plant. He suddenly becomes very attached to a plant that he has known for less than 24 hours. It's like this plant was everything for him. He just looks up to God and says, kill me, just kill me, just kill me. Which is, in fact, what God is doing, right? Killing everything in Jonah that is not fit for the kingdom. Not because God wants to make Jonah suffer, but because God is committed to Jonah. He is not going to let go. God loves Jonah. And while Jonah wrestles against this sanctifying moment that sort of pulls everything in his life into this one little thing outside this city, God offers him a choice. He says, this is the end of chapter 4, the very end of Jonah. He says, the Lord says, you have been concerned about this plant. <laughs> so you didn't tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. So if that's kind of your scale of things, you love this plant, then I, God, God of the creator of the universe, scale that up a little bit. Should I not be concerned for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and their animals, which is great. And that's where the brilliant prophetic word ends. With this profound question that all of a sudden leaves the whole story, not in Jonah's lap, but in mine, in yours. We have been led unwittingly right into the heart of God where our own hearts are dreadfully exposed inside that light for what they are exposed to God's heart. We get swallowed up in his heart and we discover that this whole story is intentionally about us. If you're alive to the world at all right now, it would be pretty hard to avoid the fact that Jonah's story is extremely relevant and his question is our question in a season when the climate is so thick with schadenfreude, cynicism and anger and politics and fear and worry and uncertainty about the future and prejudice, Jonah's question becomes an invitation, a, such a gracious invitation to us to something different. It's just a simple question. Do you want to be a builder or a hater? Jonah was a brilliant prophet who told a brilliant story it was his story and it was the word of the lord tim keller says we only know this story because jonah was willing to tell it after the fact jonah lived it and then saw realized the story itself was the real word of the Lord, and it is a love story, a love story between God and Jonah, between God and people, between Jonah and people. Jonah was so sanctified by his own experience that he thought nothing after the fact of telling his own story, raw, the raw truth, giving himself away. So that not only did Nineveh get saved by his story, but you and I have the chance to get saved by his story too. Because here's the thing. That one little, I, everything else about my life is great, except that one little thing. That one little thing is not, I'm not giving that up. Everything else, I mean, I follow Jesus. That one thing. And Jonah says, no, it ripples. It ripples. You sit in the bottom of the boat, asleep and, un and unaware. A lot of people are affected. 
when you repent, even the animals get saved. If you're alive to your own feelings at all, it would be pretty hard to avoid this story as your story. Running, avoiding, clinging to your prejudices, getting tossed overboard, swallowed up, held down by whatever monster has surfaced in your life. And all the while, and I want you to hear this as grace, as extreme grace, all the while, God is committed to you. God loves you. God waits patiently for the process to have its way. Because our God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God longs to see us swallowed up in his love. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they will be children of God. My peace I give you, my peace I give, not as the world gives. A new commandment I give you, love one another. This God longs for us to come into his heart. I want to ask you to stand. So the invitation is simply to contemplate your own, that, those spots, those little isolated places in your life that you might want to say, well, it's just that, everything else is great. And, and, and Jonah says, no, it turns out whew. so you have to deal at the character level with all of it. Do you want to be a builder or a hater? Could it be that that thing in your life, that person, that one spot, that one area who is causing you grief is there precisely because God is inviting you into a deeper experience of his grace for you. So that's your invitation. I invite you to pray. If you'd like to come, kneel, be on your face, however it works for you. I would be so pleased to have you come and just let God deal with you. God, my, my heart, you've led us right into your heart. And I'm just so grateful, God, for Jonah, for his brilliance in, 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 in finding a way to tell his story so that we find ourselves with him on this journey, not being yelled at by him, but with him on this journey of sanctification, understanding that all of us, somewhere, we're on the dock at Joppa, we're in the belly of the boat, we're being thrown overboard, we are in the belly of the fish, God, I, th I think that's maybe our deep hope. Maybe it's that we made it to the bottom. We've hit bottom and we're ready to be saved. But my prayer, God, is, is that we won't find ourselves on the other side of that turmoil still holding on tenaciously to our prejudices, to our angers, to our gracelessness, to our enemy. God, show us your heart. And God, I just say for all of us, here is ours. Here is ours. You're welcome to come and pray. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true, as I am found, I am yours, I am loved, I'm made pure, I have life, I can't
can breathe, I am healed, I am free. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. I am found, I am yours, I am loved, I'm made pure, I have life, I can breathe, I am healed, I am free, cause you are strong, you are sure, you are life, you endure, you are good. Always true, you are light breaking through. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Here's my life, Lord. Here's my life, Lord. Here's my life, Lord. Speak what is true. Our God is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And he invites us into his heart. Oh, can you imagine just being swallowed up by the very heart of God? That's the invitation. I'm trusting and believing that you will go this week inspired to, to, to be swallowed up in his love and to to let that love leak out, drip all around you. I am grateful to you guys for your willingness to continue not only worshiping God through your giving, but supporting our ministry through your giving, our church together, the church that we hold together. Thank you. I mean, you literally are holding it together in this strange season by your willingness to stay engaged and invested, and I'm grateful. You can, you can give electronically, text give mode 73256. Um, you can also give by clicking the Give tab on our website, mosaicchurchevans.org. Uh, it will take you through the process either way. It will take you through the process in order to give. If you are here in person and you'd like to give by cash or check, there are baskets on either side near the, the exit, so you can drop that in on your way out. And I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're starting a new group this week. Dee Dee Lawson will be leading the workbook Supernatural with a group of folks. And we have some folks from Mosaic who are part of it. We also have some folks in the Atlanta area who are part of this 
uh, group, but Dee Dee wanted to meet those of us who are in Evans and who were able to be here on Wednesday night, so she'll actually be here for the first uh, group meeting, which is this uh, Wednesday night. You can go to our website, click on Life Groups, and it will uh, show you exactly how to get connected with a Life Group. You can also text Heather uh, or, or, or email Heather, heather at mosaicchurchevans.org if you want more information. But that starts Wednesday at, is it 6.30 or 6? Let's say 6. You'll be early if it's 6.30. Um, and, uh, and so that's happening this week. If you haven't already gotten yourself connected to a group, it's a great opportunity. Um, Didi is a uh, just, just newly retired United Methodist pastor who has a heart for Jesus and uh, full of the Holy Spirit. I'm just really, really blessed and honored that she would be willing to lead this for us. I hope you join. Go in peace, and may the peace of God go with you.